Do you see, are we good? Can you tell everything's? I do not see anything yet. But that live. Just means that we're not live. I could just need to refresh over here on my end. Yep, there we are. All right. Hey, Facebook. Hopefully y'all can hear me and see us. It looks like we are up and live on Facebook. We're gonna start letting people in on Zoom as well. Got some people here that we can let in the waiting room. Hello, Zoom friends. Welcome. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Elizabeth. Yes. Facebook Live is growing over here. Hey, Facebook, we're going to start in just one minute. One minute. Oh, my gosh. It's both <laughs> of you. Hello. Uh, hi. <laughs> Both of you. <laughs> it's so good to see you. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> We're excited to be here. Thanks for asking us. Now I have to control my 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 excitement. <laughs> I have the Harris sisters on with me. I'm just uh, just in the presence of greatness today. <laughs> <laughs> As are we. Right. <laughs> Harris sisters on with me. I'm just uh, just in the presence of greatness today. <laughs> As are we. <laughs> is that is that your Facebook um uh, echoing? Yes, it is. There we All go. Right, put you guys back on mute. All right, perfect. All right, you ready to go? Yep, let's roll. Let's do it. I'm gonna let Stephanie in here. Um, hey, everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Beyond the Steps. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us from Facebook Live uh, and here on Zoom. So I'm Bree. I'm a co-founder of Apollo Performance Wear, and I'm here with my friend, uh, Melissa McDaniel, who is the founder of Turning Point Creations. She's an educator. She's a choreographer and a social justice advocate. Today, we're answering the question, how do we eliminate racial bias in the dance studio environment. There's a lot of work to do in the dance industry to address racial bias specifically. There is some work being done and we're taking baby steps to addressing this really, really important issue, um, but it's gonna take continuing conversations like this to affect real change. Um, before we introduce our guest panelists for this very important episode, I wanna give a few reminders. Throughout the episode, you may see Melissa and me looking around. Um, it's not because we're crazy. It's because we are monitoring our chat on Zoom. We're talking to our friends over on Facebook, and we're also pulling in our friends from Instagram uh, with the hopes of driving this conversation in a bigger way and getting lots of perspectives and participation. Uh, so just uh, if you have any questions or comments, please pop them in the chats. We will make sure we get those things addressed and answered for you on this episode. Um, this is all about sharing perspective with open hearts and open minds and, and learning because because when you know better, you do better. We're going to say that a lot. Um, no question is silly, and we want to hear your thoughts. We ask to please be respectful. That's it. And uh, let's take this next step forward together. Um, so let's get to it. Melissa. Yes, I am so excited to um, introduce our guest today. She is extremely, extremely accomplished in this area, and I just can already see the wealth of knowledge that's going to come from this Asia Upchurch. Um, Asia Upchurch is the dancing diplomat. She's an award-winning artist, passionate educator, and sought-after consultant who creates, facilitates, and designs for radical change. She holds an MA in International Peace and Conflict Resolution from American University and a Master's in Education from Harvard University. Asia is a lecturer on education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where she has pioneered courses and initi initiatives excuse me, to elevate hip-hop and movement as necessary tools for a transformative education. She is the founder and director of Hip Hop X, a lab project that explores the power of hip hop in education through intergenerational programming. As a dancer and choreographer, Asia considers herself a storyteller who leans on African diasporic movement to create stories of joy, connection, and liberation on stage that seek to stir up that which is stagnant in order to bring performance, performers and audiences into closer dialogue with each other and themselves. Endeavoring never to separate her identity as an artist and educator, her work on stage and in the classroom braids together social justice and youth advocacy and provides the foundation for her media and merchandise project, DOPE, 
Dismantling Oppression and Pushing Education. We are so happy to have you here. With Welcome, Asia. Asia. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for reading that. I should really just give a two-liner. <laughs> no, it's perfect. We need all that. We needed all that. Um, and I just want to remind everyone who's coming into Facebook, who may have come in a little late, we are talking with Asia Upchurch, and we are working on the question today, how do we as dance educators work to recognize and work to eliminate racial bias? Notice the word work. Work is work. in the title. That's a work. work. <laughs> right? <laughs> work to eliminate racial bias in the studio environment. So I want to start with a, a, a question first that came from your bio, Asia, that I thought was really interesting. You have a very specific commitment, as you put it, to never separate your identity as an artist and an educator. Can you tell us why that's so important to you? Yeah, um, thank y'all so much for just getting a, to sup with you, as they would say in the church. Um, so I think for me, that's important. That comes after uh, a lot of years of like, I love to dance. I love youth advocacy. I love this. And I couldn't, it took me a while to figure out that those things are not disjointed because they all live inside of me. They belong together. And once I availed, I think myself first, mm -hmm. not have to hold that up to what does it look like for other people? And like, what do I say? At like a networking event, like, what do you do for a living? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and once I realized that my, my inquiry, my passion, my whole mindset as an artist, as an educator are woven together that, I don't have to keep trying to separate them and justify how they look to other people. And so I even think that is a bit of like reclaiming work that is necessary for us to like unplug from the like, I'm borrowing, borrowing this from Dr. Sean Jenright and um, others, like what you do is not who you are. What title mm -hmm. you occupy is not who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I think um, also, particularly in this US context where arts are, are often relegated to like, oh, it's, it's a good um, hobby and, and release. And it's not, it's not intellectual, it's not academic, it's not rigorous, it's not real. It's not real work. Um, I also don't wanna try to hide it under the rug that like artistry, my artist lens is so integral to how I navigate about this world and so I'm not going to separate that out just because you don't have the language in the frame to receive it. Right. Awesome. That is perfect. And I definitely agree with that. That separation is there and it's a, it's a wedge that's run in there by society. Um, just because sometimes we, when we're teaching children, people say you should teach children with a very objective lens. And as an artist, you don't have an objective lens right your art your artistry comes from within and you have to try that has to come through to your to your students exactly and as long as you're responsible with that you know the responsibility of that it all it's all it all comes out wonderful in the end um so you know, thank you for that thank you so we're going to jump into our very first topic very first question is i think super important because we have a wide variety of people who are, are watching today some who on the spectrum of uh, awareness of racial bias or bias period is like at a 10 and some that are at a one. <laughs> so and no some one, may not even know what it is or that they even have one or, right. or, or some, you know? Um, so yeah. Yeah. So uh, can you give our viewers a baseline understanding of what bias is and just define bias for us and talk a little bit about how racial, divide, uh, racial bias is developed, learned, and perpetuated? That's a big question, I know. So my I know, I'm like, pieces. Uh, <laughs> okay, 60 seconds on the clock. Um, right. <laughs> oh, bias. I think this is a beautiful uh, question. And also it's a beautiful question as an exercise for all of us to like remove this idea of these practices as vocabulary only because bias is not a word that just you write on a page or you read. It is a practice. It is an attitude, it is a mindset, it is something that gets passed on. It's something that actually actively happens. It's not like bias, I can define it according to dictionary.com. So for me, the exercise of, of, of defining what it is, I really think bias is um, a predisposition to prefer something regardless if you actually know why you do. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then you engage that predisposition uh, without consideration that it might be a predisposition. So, and it's very mm -hmm. insidious because of how we grow up. You know, your first contact zone in life starts feeding what are those predispositions? What are those preferences that you didn't know were your preferences? They're just in there. And I think when you bias, I feel like happens that naturally, like I grew up where people played outside. So I feel some type of way where people are not playing outside because it goes against what was normalized for me. Right. I think the tension with mm -hmm. admitting that bias is a real thing is because once you look at it, it's going to reveal to you the things that were not told about to you that happened on the other side of that. Like, um, whether that's race, whether that's who should date whom, what, who, what is gender. The moment somebody goes, that's not the full definition of that experience. I think that's where the tension with like, I, well, I mean, but I'm a good person. Bias and being a good person have nothing to do with each other. Right. right. Yeah, there are a right. lot of terrible people on this planet that did good acts, but the net of what they did was was terrible. So I think for me, bias is those, it's those insidious habits that we have that quite honestly don't give lens to the fullness of, of whatever that is. Again, that could be race, that could be food, that could be where you live. Um, and so everybody has them. Like everybody got eyebrows, everybody got eyelash, right. everybody, has everybody got bias. Right, 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 exactly. Um, that is that leads leads me into a very interesting follow up question that I thought of while you were speaking, um, and you you kind of hit on it that when you say oh that's a bias or you identify a bias in someone or you walk someone through a journey to say you know what I think your perspective may be clouded or informed by a bias mm -hmm. um, that you've learned. They say, especially right racial bias. I'm not racist. That's the first thing that usually comes out of, yeah. of someone's mouth when you say that. What's the connection between racism and bias and is there a difference or how are, how are they connected? They're, I feel like they're, they're siblings, um, mm -hmm. but then this is a huge table. So sexism is that that is a sibling of, uh, of bias or maybe bias is like a parent or some type of parental or, or, or guardian figure. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think um, also people think racist is like a word. So like if I say racist, that makes me racist. And no, like if you act racist, that makes you racist. <laughs> right. If you also realize that you have some biases that were passed down regarding race because this country sucks at race. Most countries suck at race. This country sucks at race and understanding how this construct became a practice, informed policies, advantaged some for no other reason than the amount of melanin in or not in their bodies and did the opposite to others. Mm -hmm. And so um, people don't want to feel bad. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know if you've all like, I love feeling terrible. And I love <laughs> feeling terrible because of the terrible things I do to people. Like nobody wants that. Right. So because again, uncovering bias is going to then bring up all those other siblings that were at the table. Right and you don't wanna feel bad. So when people don't wanna feel bad, absence, absent of any other mechanisms to give us better response, our first thing is to defend, even if it's dead wrong. I ain't racist, boo. We, we talk about step one, bias is real. Mm -hmm. You jumping to I'm not racist is like a cover. Like if I say it, then nobody can ask me like where that came from, um, I can perform being anti-racist and put a Black Lives Matter sign in my window or on my website, then, you know, nobody's going to actually like go underneath and ask like, what did I what do? That? And right. so I think it's a knee-jerk reaction because again, as humans, we don't want to feel outed. We don't want to feel bad. We love pleasure is, pleasure is a part of the human experience. We desire pleasure, right? Um, and it's not pleasing to feel like, oh, snap. I had no idea that bias comes with blinking and that also 
racist behaviors and attitudes also may have gotten in that DNA with me. Maybe I never acted on it outright, but it is within me and nobody wants to feel that. Right. So that's where that knee jerk. Right. Right. Um, but they are related. They're not, they are not the same, but they are kindred. I think there is some type of like seed mm -hmm. or plant or parent fruit, however, you, whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, right. And then with that is like, because you're trying to guard, I think when you realize you have had these ideas and has afforded you some access, mm -hmm. then you have to be like, well, I'm not a bad person. I didn't put those things into play. And it's not my fault that I wasn't there the day racism was handed out, but I'm benefiting from it. So I'm not racist because I didn't create the system. Mm -hmm. And you saying bias makes me think of the word racism, on my discomfort. So I'm gonna just yell it. Right. I'm a racist. Right. And you might be. Right. But if you're the one that's getting offended by that term too, chances are you're not the one having to deal with the other end of it, which is really important. It's, it is a lot easier to just stick with what you know and what you feel and go, well, I'm not racist. That doesn't include me. But and, you know, until you take a look at the greater problem, you're, you're really not helping do anything about it. You know, you're, you're, you're refusing to acknowledge that it is an issue by saying that. Yeah. And I just want to say something really quickly, the, what you said, like, um, being offended also is, uh, um, I have been in experiences where people will pull phrases. I call them like, your, like it's like a prepaid cell phone. And these prepaid excuses, these these already pre pre uh pre selected outs of a conversation. If I say you offended me, I'm trying to dead the conversation. Okay. I don't think anybody can be offended by the word racist. You are uncomfortable by the reality of racism and how it lives in you. And so again, you're trying to dead it. You're trying to create a wall. I'm offended. Why would you call me racist? We have now shifted from racism existing to how you feel, mm -hmm. and like. Said, I think that people don't think about however you stand on that side of it, particularly if you're the person who's benefiting from it. The last thing that's really important at that moment is your feelings about hearing a word, which is a practice. So I also just think like language and also gets coded into whose feelings get protected, right? Whose offense do we run to? Whose defense do we abandon? It's all like, it's all at that table and it's really messy. And people don't like mess. People don't like discomfort. Right. And so it's easier to just stay in. Yeah. You offended me. Which I'm then. Gone now, tend to my emotions. It's like, that's not, that's not the point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we have some engagement and I, I have a question as well, but uh, some comments we have are Desiree Parkman, microaggressions also get mixed up with this, which is a great point. Can you talk a little bit about microaggressions and, and what that means in regards to racial bias? Absolutely. I want to say for folks, I'm from the north side of St. Louis, Missouri. I'm proud of that. And that's a very specific and real place. Yeah. And um, I did not even hear the term microaggression until about like, honestly, six years ago. And I was confused mm -hmm. because I feel like if you aggress me, I'm aggressed. <laughs> There's nothing micro about it. <laughs> micro about it. A paper cut actually is a serious situation. Okay. <laughs> and you know, you don't know that it's serious because it's there and it's taking everything all day. You run your hand on the water, the cleaning is like <laughs> something else rubs again. And so for me, when I think about microaggression, I'm also thinking about what are we trying to make feel more comfortable? If you are harming my being as a human, micro and macro is outside of the question. It's not right. It's dehumanizing, period. I think microaggressions also are at this table, like this, this, this jacked up table of oppression and isms. Um, and microaggressions are the things that sometimes hide and always oh, just a joke. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean that. I ain't racist. I got five black friends. What are you counting? Um, right. it's those little things are like, oh, you're very articulate from somebody from the um, inner city. It's, oh, wow. You know, I didn't realize women could do that. Well, that's good for a blind person. It's these things that expose, again, a lack of awareness of, of, of self, a lack of awareness of our larger context and history as, as, our, as, our, as, our, as, as a people. Mm -hmm. um, and culture is, is many things. It, it exposed microaggressions are those things that like, again, I was trying to placate something that I can't like register. And 
you know, um, and it seems, and we've normal, they become normalized. And so, um, you know, working, it even happens, I find like a, a, an aggression is when I think in um, a lot in, in, in kind of nonprofit sector where there are youth and there are funders, mm -hmm. and particularly these are youth of color or youth or non-gender binary youth or youth with disabilities. And then it's the big show and the funders come who have never seen these kids and they are like, oh my, that's so good for you all. Wow, you all should feel proud that you did that. And it's like, you have no idea of the brilliance and the intelligence that is with these people every day, 24, 7, 365. But your narrative is, I'm here because of this privilege and this comfort and this access that I have that is not really God given, it is an artificial. And I feel good by giving money to people who were not granted that. And now the microaggression is me telling you, you should feel proud. Who are you? You're not my mama, my daddy, my auntie. You're not, you don't know how pr I'm proud every day. You should feel uncomfortable that you are not as talented. Right. Right. <laughs> and so I think microaggressions are those actions that reveal to us how insidious bias right. is yes. and yes. how we normalize racism or discomfort around the isms. Uh, but again, I just feel like it's all aggression. It's all dehumanizing. Right. Thank in order you for to that. Um, perpetuate a microaggression, you have to already have believed that there's a deficit there that you need to actually, you know, mm -hmm. address. So yeah. you already have to think that there was a deficit for you to say, wow, I'm so glad you overcame that deficit. Well, if you already believe that there was one, yes. therein lies an, an issue. And it becomes about how that person is having an emotional response to fill in the blank. And so it actually, it, it is centering how this person feels who may be guest in a space when it's not, mm -hmm. that's not, that's not the point either. So that mm -hmm. you feel so great that I'm articulate is still centering you and what you've normalized. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm articulate every day of the week, boo. I'm multilingual. Right. You should feel bad that you're not. Right. But I, if I say that, then I'm the attitude, no fill in the trope, mm -hmm. like black right. girl, woman and all of those things. So that's a right. comment that we have in the chat too. Protecting non-Black people's feelings adds even more emotional work as well. Um, when we when we're worried about <laughs> the people who aren't really experiencing this on a daily basis, we're worried about also protecting their feelings and making sure that they're okay. Um, that just is just so tough to do and manage on top of your own, right? Yeah. Um, so my, make space says, how do you navigate racial bias in predominantly minority spaces? And that also applies to dance, mm -hmm. obviously. So navigating racial bias in predominantly minority spaces, I think um, uh, my friends who know me, like I have a, had a big, huge crossword puzzle phase. I do love words. Um, they call me word perv. <laughs> And then the more that I've been in, the, in academia and realizing that there is um, this power given to like language and that language can actually be used as a tool, an intentional tool of, of division and marginalization. Um, so I try to, one, I, I want to encourage folks to um, be able to name and cite things as specifically as possible. Right. Um, and so there is a time like minority, when I think about the word minority right now, I'm going, well, what or who in what context is minoritized? Um, so are we talking about how to navigate racial bias mm -hmm. in spaces where there's predominantly people from the same um, economic class and that class happens to be like lower um, SES or we have spaces where we're talking about is predominantly people of color, indigenous folk. Um, in spaces that were created by uh, white folks. Um, so I, when I'm thinking about it, I think racial bias is always there. And because race and its construct and how we have as humans, and I'm saying we, because that is real for all of us all to do that work and go, we have all made the construct real. Mm -hmm. We have all operationalized it in so many facets of our life. And so I, I want to say, if I'm reading this question correctly, and please, um, correct me, uh, jump in if not, if it's going a different way, is that racial bias is not just about um, biases white people or non-people of color have towards people of color. Because people of color, because race is so diverse and not a monolith, like 
it means we all get to do some of that work, right? You were talking about Rachel in the beginning, like we are not Rachel, uh, Melissa in the beginning, we all have this work. So I can normalize my experience as a black identifying person from the North side of St. Louis who grew up predominantly around black people. Um, I can start normalizing all black people to that experience of blackness, which is not a monolith. And I'm disregarding the larger diaspora of African peoples and dark and dark folks. So I got to do that work. Mm -hmm. I did not grow up around anything but, but, but black people, African American folks. So as I have more contact with people who identify differently, I had to be like, yo, um, first of all, stop calling everybody Mexican because that's hella wrong. Um, stop thinking that uh, Latinx is one thing because that's also hella wrong. Like I so, um, uh, so I think we all have that work. And I think as folks who are in minoritized classes, because we, f we are, it's not just a feeling, we have been so gravely ignored and marginalized. We are wanting something to come to us from what has been the dominant culture, white European aesthetic, right? And it should come, they owe us, right? At the same time, we have to be mindful that I think there hasn't been anything more intentionally and more, more powerfully designed than systems of, 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 of built on alleged white supremacy. They didn't leave any nook unturned. So it also means that as, as a black person of color, I have to think about what are the biases I have around other folks of color? Or what do I have biases around, around other folks who identify as, 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 as woman or man or, you know, or non-gen? It's work for all of us to do um, and it's uncomfortable. But show up for it. That's yeah, that. Right. Like, there's no neat answer but to show up for. It. And I think thinking about dance spaces um, and spaces that were it shows up in the curriculum, like whose dance forms are considered the core. Right. Dance forms are that's a cute elective. Mm -hmm. But those dance forms are are traditionally born in the backs of 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 Black Indigenous African diasporic people who have given the world so much beautiful cultural production since day one. But all of that's gonna fit into world dance, <laughs> right? <laughs> like it's that is it is that's bias that becomes practice and becomes normal. Where now in 2020 and higher ed, many dance departments are having their moment of reckoning where it's like, maybe just having ballet and modern wasn't right, you think? <laughs> and so you can, I say that because like with how spaces are designed, when we want to think about who the people are in the place, that's one thing. We also have to think about what kind of social uh, contracts were put into the design of a place. I work at Harvard. I'm very understanding that Harvard was built in 1636. It was not thinking about you, <laughs> exactly. Safe to say yes. <laughs> yes, you know what I mean? And so understanding the rule the, the 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 social location norms that have been like who gets to be here what gets to be here um i can't ignore that i'm operating with that in the front of my mind and going i'm not going to fall into that default i'm going to find the people who i can have alliance with allyship with accomplishment accomplish uh, accomplishment with it whatever the word is like folks who are willing to get into this good kind of trouble to make the space more humanizing mm -hmm. yeah, and liberating and this is a great lead into the next question. Um, if for those joining, I'm seeing people popping on and off. I'm uh, Bree Zabrowski with Apollo and chatting uh, with my co-host, Melissa McDaniel and Asia Upchurch. And we're talking about how do we recognize and eliminate racial bias in the dance studio environment? This is a big one and we could, we could be here for days and not not get to all of it. So we're really uh, you know digging into it on a foundational level right now. So Asia, customs and practices in the dance world have been passed down for hundreds of years. You know, the dance industry is deeply rooted in tradition and many of those are outdated and we have a really hard time letting those things go in the dance world specifically. Um, they were These traditions were born um, out of societies that were oppressive to people of color. What are some ways that racial bias shows up in the dance industry? and maybe even more specifically dance education. And I think it's important to name these because mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people in the dance world that, that don't really realize how much this exists. Right. So, so what are those things? Yeah, well, I have a fan favorite um, that, and this I've seen this in community studios and in uh, higher ed dance studios, 
the floor, the dance floors, and whose shoes get to be on the dance studio floors. Okay. So you design this place to be inclusive for everybody to be there. You've put this maybe expensive, maybe not Marley down everywhere. And then you had an awakening. You were like, let's have hip hop here. Oh, but y'all can't wear y'all sneakers in here. Yep. That's such a great point. And I have fought on this because either you want the whole thing or you shouldn't get to get it. Yep. And it's a struggle, right? Because it's like, but fighting and advocating for that dance style, that dance form, uh, which is associated with um, youth, with this associated with people of color, which is very specifically associated with black and brown bodies, which comes from a history of associating those bodies with, with criminalizing those bodies just for existing. We don't want that behavior, but we want the money this art form will bring to this studio. But can y'all not wear your proper footwear. It's that little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's major because I would not ask, I would I would not ask the ballet class to ask their dancers not to put on ballet slippers. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's one of the little things. So I think one is like when when folks are thinking about you're having your moment of um when you're having your moment of reckoning and redesigning your curriculum, I also want to say this, particularly for those, for those in the US, we also suck with the notion of integration. Uh, we have thought that has meant simply add the cherry on top to whatever is there, knowing that the ice cream in the bowl is spoiled and cracked. But just put the cherry on top. That's what the people have been clamoring for. Let, let's have cherries on top. Yeah. Let's have hip hop here. Let's add some brown bodies here. Let's add this class here. But the the other rest of the substance and the foundation that that container is messed up. So you can't just add a hip hop class because you now want to satisfy a diversity checklist, but you're not going to allow the shoes to be there. You don't want the muse, certain kind of music played and you want people to have certain credentials to teach the class when the culture is, is, is alive and well because of founders who are still out here in these streets and should be teaching it, but they don't need an MFA or a PhD. Right. They are the whole culture. And so it's, it's this really problematic additive element of integration that I think I have found in the dance education world. And I, what I'm witnessing and experiencing different institutions go through with like combing through. And it's like, perhaps to have that cherry, you need a different bowl, but you don't want to touch that. And you don't want to agitate anything else that's there. Right. So- it's, it's messier than that for yep. sure. And how important I've been having a lot of these conversations lately is teaching the hit, the history and the culture behind that form of dance, because I think, you know, the dance industry is in this very cyclical behavior of you teach the way you were taught and you repeat and you learn and you teach and repeat. And it's just this unbroken, never ending circle of, of just, um, and, and we evolve over that time and we learn over that time yet our practices don't because we're just repeating without editing, without evolving. Um, how important is that history and, and that culture to each style of dance? And I'm not just saying hip hop or tap. I'm saying all of it. Well, it's, 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 what's the, um, expression, uh, no, N O or K-N-O-W, no history, no self, mm -hmm. or N-O, no history, no self. Right. That is for everyone. And it's also, I, I love that, that, that provocation, um, Brie, because um, everybody stands to mine and know history, no self more, and not just rely on the resources that are handed to you to provide you a convenient telling of history. Right. Um, I think when we know, and even if we get have to expose the uncomfortable parts, but if we can just like commit to knowing, then that, that's going to cue us to stop committing to erasure. Right. Like I can't erase something that is like being very obviously in front of my face. Yeah. This is actually how this form started and it makes it more beautiful. It doesn't like teaching or knowing a full history, I don't think personally should make it feel 
more, or should make it feel ugly or hard or, or exclusive. Um, and so let's tell a more rich, full story of ballet as social and court and its evolution of dance and where it started. Let's tell a more full, rich history of modern dance. Let's tell a more full, rich history of, of dances of all kinds of people who have been dancing in circles, singing in circles, and how that can inform the design. Like, I also think, and, I, and I, then here's the thing, like, be honest with self. Because I was teaching in a way, I was like, well, this is how I was taught. And then I got that to that moment of agitation. That's why I'm like, I'm here to agitate the soil, because I think beautiful growth happens when you, when you get in there and you muck it up. Mm -hmm. Once I realized... I might be perpetuating some things that like I can recognize aren't good. Then I go, well, how to let, I, then I'm going to, I'm going to do it differently. I'm not going to assign like really crazy rubrics to dance skills that are just about a letter grade when really it should be about, do people know how to trust their bodies and be willing to try more and to ask friends, how does, what you got, how can you help me? It's like, once I know, like you, for me, like using hip hop as an example, if you really understand hip hop culture, it doesn't make, make sense. It is inappropriate to teach it in a very traditional in a uh, Western academia, academia sense. It's, it, they are incongruent. Yeah. You know, give yourself grace when you come to these moments of like dissonance and don't like try to throw yourself out with the bath water, go, okay, now that I'm at this moment of knowing and awareness, what's one thing I can change? Yeah. Then what's one more thing? But um, the, not, the history part, I think absent of historical context, we are, we are compliant with a, a, a system of normalizing erasure. And I think erasure is so dehumanizing. Yeah. And it's important to know this is going to take effort, right? Like if you're a dance educator, again, it's the process of like, we do what's been done and we're on this autopilot of like going through our year because there's, there, Melissa and I talked about this last week, there's never an off season, there's never a downtime. So you really are going to have to step outside of yourself and go find the information and find the resources and be able to take the time and integrate that into your lesson plan. That means no more doing what I used to do because starting from the moment that you're aware that this is an issue, you have a responsibility to do better. If you didn't know to that point, that's fine, but do the work now and put it into play now. And, and I think, and I'm guilty of it too. Like, look, look, I'm on this journey with everybody else. Like, and I am, I am it's guilty of it. I've taught hip hop. I have hip hop. I've taught, you know, jazz funk. I've taught all the things for many, many years and never really giving, you know, the proper amount of time and dedication to what that history is. But now I know, and I'm telling you, they're out there. There's free resources everywhere you look. YPAD did a history of hip hop culture with John Comix Barella and Leslie Scott. It was free. Like if you weren't on that, if you, you have a responsibility to go find that recording. So the, the resources are there. Um, and it's important that they take time to find them. I just want to stress that. Absolutely. And if anything, um, if anything's become more apparent to me in this um, this reality of, 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 of virtual learning is, uh, like you said, there are a lot of resources online. They A lot of things have been online, but even more because absent of being able to congregate in person and have that we are having to create more intentionally these places to bump in and to learn. And so I honestly believe like right now, people have no excuse. <laughs> like, you might have had one in fall 2019, but right now, boo, I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Get on anybody's live. Get on yeah. just right. We got to do like deep academic research, just like a good Google and the land you want the first to will get you somewhere. And I think um, it's also reveals that we're uncomfortable with like recognizing this isn't going to be a light switch. And I think for me as an educator on the side, when I started making shifts because I'm like, this is, I know this is right. I then you also have to prepare yourself to be ready for the resistance from your students. And it's not that they are resisting you. It's not that they are saying what you're doing is wrong. They have, they also have not been modeled, it's not been modeled for them another way to approach learning about the history of dance while also learning the technique. Like they're just used to Autobot showing up, somebody gonna tell my body to do something and that's it. And so what it took me a while to get over the hump, like, why am I feeling like I, I have checked with some folks. I've checked in with some elders. Like, I feel like this is the better way to like go about this thing. And why is it the resistance? It's because it's the resistance. It's just trying to like 
rationalize a whole new way of being in the dance learning space with an educator who's going, we gonna get this time, this time do, and we gonna get some knowledge. You gonna so, get this- but why is that important for our students? So, because you're you're really leading me into the, the next questions, really in a great way. But, um, why is it? I, I know you're, you're amazing. Um, why is this important for the students? Not only the students of color, but but for for not. Why is this important for our students as a whole? that we're making sure we're addressing this and acknowledging it rather than burying our head in the, the proverbial sand. I think we all miss out on some liberation when we're not living in truth. Yeah. You no, know? I mean, listen, I am such a human. I'm y'all, I am flying fabulous and flawless like everybody else, right? And so, but I know like on a personal level when I really get truthful with Asia, like Asia, let's, let's, let's have a moment, okay, okay? <laughs> Let's without judgment, but let's just have a moment. Like that's what you did, boo. And I'm like, you're right. There, even though that's uncomfortable, something gets liberated. I start finding a new source of like energy, of optimism, of focus, of diligence. And I'm like, I rob myself of that when I'm being dishonest with myself. So then translating that into the very much more like transactional uh, relationship of what's happening in classrooms students, all of us are robbed of some other higher level of existing, of knowing, of even being in our craft when we don't have the truth. And um, I think it also takes us an educator, like I, I, I really try to consider myself more of a facilitator than like a teacher. There are things that I can instruct and I can walk someone through and I can help them get. But I really feel like my role in a classroom is to be a facilitator. There's people with information and experience and how can I make the space open for all of us to feel that, to exchange with that so that we can grow. And I'm in that, I also think students also get to learn. I don't have to be a passive um, kind of autobot that shows up and somebody deposits something in me. It's like, oh, this, this activates that thing I learned from my grandmama in the kitchen and that's real knowledge, that's not an aside. And so I think it also opens up something for students to like trust what they know and not just wait for somebody to tell them what's important. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it is, I think it's important for our students to have experiences of transformative teaching and learning that is not just about, and the Freire, as Freire calls it, the banking model. We are trying to, to rise above that. I'm not just trying to like tell you, put your foot to the right and then turn your head to the right. Yeah. I want you to have an experience where you get to learn your body. You can tap into all of those memories or transform ones that weren't positive into like being comfortable in your body where you understand you can do that. And A, I'm in the pocket. I can't tell you to be in the pocket and you be in the pocket. You got to avail yourself to be in the pocket. And that's going to come with how we design spaces to allow people to try to learn from their partner. Don't dance towards me. I move around the room. That's the one tip I want to tell teachers. If you're still in the in parked, parked and barking in the front of the room, you're doing your students a disservice. Because now actually they are just trying to perform and do for you. They're not actually tapping into themselves. So decentering yourself quite physically in the space. Also, I think let students go, I want to try to figure this out. And they're giving me some nuggets of history for me to like try to tap into the genesis of where this came and, and what's been my exposure to it and how can I make, how can I honor the technique and the and the and the craft and how can I find my own space in that? And so I think it's multi-layered, um, the, the levels of liberation that we can explore when we are offering truth and an environment that allows people to engage multi-directionally. Thank you so much. That was a great explanation. Really, really great. I think, um, Aisha, that we are really, the future generations, dating myself, but future generations of, of dancers, they're living in a different world, a world where change is happening, change is it is going to happen it can't be stopped it's moving forward and the more that we go into a classroom and we refuse to acknowledge that we're stifling them we're stifling them as dancers and we're stifling them as humans and Bria and I have said this on shows before we are teaching the whole human not just the dancer, not just the artist. And we've said, I've said this plenty of times, the, the, the letters and, and texts that I get from students, they never say, hey, I was so glad that you got me to win that triple double plat- titanium platinum first place award. It's <laughs> always, I thought about this story you told me about when you went to college or this story you told me about something that you dealt with. 
And if we don't acknowledge the change, push the change, model the change, we're, we're not create, we're not only not creating great dancers, we're not creating great humans. And that is, that's just a, a big disservice that I think we need to, we need to, um, to definitely address. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to also realize like, um, you know, everybody won't sign up to look at it that way. And what I have to tell myself, cause I care, like I'm tired after teaching. I don't know about y'all. It's not cause like, yes, I'm getting older and like maybe I can't teach for six hours straight anymore. Like I used to could like 15 years ago, but what I, what I'm tapping into even more is like what you're saying, Melissa is like, there, this is whole human, full bodied, lifelong impact learning space. So as much as I want you to like get this step, I also want you to feel like a human, have a humanizing experience. And so I am tending to the energy in the room mm -hmm. because I think that that is what is gonna last. Like, okay, I again, I can teach you how to do a baby freeze. I can teach you how to do a time step. Did I make you feel bad about yourself? Mm -hmm. Did I center fear-based learning? Or did I possibly become a, a, an ambassador for joy-based learning, for having fun while learning, mm -hmm. or iteration is okay, boo, you didn't get it today, you might not get it tomorrow, but stay with it because that is what is going to stick with you right? through whatever. And so that type of attending to the energy and to the to people's humanity, like I be, I be dead tired after like 45 minutes. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Forget four hours, just, yeah. just an hour. Yo, oh, where is my it's important. <laughs> Yeah, it's important for dance. That's not easy, right? Like it's really easy. We've talked about this, Melissa. It's easy to get wrapped up in the, do it again, do it again, you know, and get ready for the stage and get ready for the competition because you're so invested and you're so... But that's the additional challenge to all of this, right? It's where it makes it not comfortable and not easy. It, it, it's 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 hard and it's it's work. It's continuous work to check yourself and make sure that you keep it in perspective. And and at the end of the day, none of it matters except the human that walks out of your building, right? That we all sort of contribute to and piece together, right? We all have to be responsible for the energy we bring, and if we're bringing energy that is based in bias, based in fear, we're bringing that energy into our classroom and we have to start to be responsible for that. And we cannot do that if we do not acknowledge that it is there. Hello. Which, and that we need to work to make change. Being, um, being racist is an action and so is being anti-racist. So come on, you need to you need to tweet yourself on that. It's an action, bro. <laughs> they it's are both something just to put in your uh your <laughs> your, your mood or your IG story. It's an action, and it's right. not one switch one day. Right, exactly. So I we can stay on this, y'all. See yeah. hours and hours. We're already 40, 45 minutes in. We hadn't even like touched the the depth of where we want to go. But I do want to move into um listing out some categories that we can help dance educators recognize where bias might show up in these categories and how we might be able to combat that or overcome um, some of those some of those biases and, and really do some work. So I'm going to go category by category. And this is, these are just um, four categories do that are, are big in, in studio spaces. Costuming and dress code. I'm going to give them to you one, one by one, Aisha. Oh, God. <laughs> that's like listen I was the only black little swan love me some ballet was good at it my hair and a bun my skin and 1980s blue ice blue eyeshadow yep them tights and my legs mm -hmm. I'm still working through that trauma um so uh, I'm, I'm so thankful for how things have progressed and like the, the clothing, uh, dance, uh, costuming and clothing industry to have more representation of skin tones because uh, nude for my friend um, Amy was not the same as nude for you. Amy's white and blonde. Aisha was not. And <laughs> so I, I am glad that that's happening. And so I think... Um, I think actually just centering the conversation up front around like 
like not trying to wait till it's the moment to pick out costumes, but to think about proactively as dance educators, as administrators, whether it's a competition studio or you're a conservatory is how do you approach costuming? Or do you still think about a body type? Or are you looking at the bodies of your dancers? Can you have a conversation with those folks individually and go, let's work together Right, because it doesn't have to be so top down. You gonna wear this whether you feel comfortable or not. Um, so I think. Since what do you say? What do you say to the costume companies who are uh, that you know the leading costume companies in the industry that are making the costumes for children? What is it that we should be asking of them? Uh, to open up their windows or their uh, Facebook page or their IG page and look at what the world looks like. Mm -hmm. Who are you designing? It's 2020, like literally hashtag time's up for that. Yeah. We got all the articles, we got all the, the DVDs, we got, we know the evidence is there. Who are you designing for? Are you designing for the world as it is or the norm that was accepted for so long? Mm -hmm. yeah. You have all the money, you have the resources. It does not cost you, it will not hurt your sales. It'll probably, if you are money driven, it will probably boost your sales to design for the world as it is. Yeah. Yeah. And to the people out there who are, you know, it, money talks, right? And so you choose where to spend that money. You choose as a studio owner, where to put the, where your what costumes you're, you know, what you're buying for your students, what your dress code is, you can, you, where you're going to convention, where you're going to competition, um, what organizations are you supporting mm -hmm. with those dollars? And so you can really choose if you don't, if you don't see the costumes that are representative of your student base and they, they're not inclusive, then piece yeah, together yeah. your own costumes. Yeah. Or you need to together make, yourself. Um, making a demand. I think nobody wants to rock the boat send an email, pick up a phone, make a call and say, my studio is, not, the students here are not represented. This, yep. I call it raw chicken news because yep. it's not even, it's not even news. Ah, right? ah. It's <laughs> just, look, I call it raw chicken. I'm like, whose skin looks like raw <laughs> chicken? Is that Nobody. No one. Nobody. Nobody's skin looks like this. So um, it, it's just, uh, it's not what not what should be happening. So next one, curriculum and class offerings. Absolutely, the whole jiggity jam jam. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to revisit, uh, uh, um, help yourselves and look at the world as it is. Mm -hmm. um, this one's easy right now, quite honest. If you look at it as a spectrum, you can't just go, let's just add this on. Um, and I'm gonna just like put some African here. Also like, African means a lot. So what are you talking about? But um, the, the, the world, if you are a conservatory and you want to intentionally specialize in one thing, then be specific about that. Make your programming match your mission and match your audience. Where those are incongruent, you have to intervene and re redirect. So if you have this dances for everyone and everybody can move here um, mission, but your catalog has uh, classes that really don't um, exemplify that, mm -hmm. then you need to uh, not just make room for those things at the table, you need to design a new table. And if you are some, to address the questions that come up, if you feel like that you don't know how to do that on your own, there are beautiful folks and organizations in the world. Hello, Melissa. Hello, Brie. Hey, I'm here too. Quit trying to do this on your own. That's also the effect of uh, wildly rampant uh, colonial colonizing mindset of like ruthless individualistic thinking. I gotta do it on my own. We gotta, we gotta like, come on. We all have to do this work. So look to your neighbor, right? But I think um, when your course offerings, your mission statement and your audience are incongruent, you need to revisit also because I, I don't I don't um, advocate for cancel culture. However, we are in a time where it's very easy to call people out. Mm -hmm. I do kind of want to be more of a call people in and help and heal and restore versus call out and cancel. Mm -hmm. But if you are fear driven, own that and be like, I don't want to get called out. So let me do something. So do something. Right. Do something. Yeah. This is a big one for me, this next one. And I don't think that people recognize uh, how bias shows up here because it happens in classroom, like traditional classrooms, K through 12, your, your traditional subjects, as well as in your arts. Classroom management. So classroom management and discipline. All right. So let's just, um, I'm from the show me state. Uh, let's, let's call it how it is. 
Um, if for you, classroom management is about getting bodies to act like white compliant ones, you have to retool your whole mind. Mm. Um, the way that people talk with each other is very, very driven culturally. Mm -hmm. And culture, again, is not race. Those are not synonyms. Right. Culture is about class. Culture is about ethnicity, race, gender, culture of where you grew up. Um, so folks who are used to leaning in and laughing and testifying as part of showing active participation, if for you that looks like a non-compliant body, your idea of what um, classroom management is, 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 is really rooted on policing traditionally bodies of color. And that's, I'm going to say this, that's wrong. Sometimes I don't say what's right or what's wrong, but that is wrong. When you are trying to police people into compliance, and that is a synonym for like performing white, um, white respectability, um, no, stop. Um, also, classroom management, how you manage your classroom should not also be a synonym for how do you respond to behavior? Where are your tools located? How do you display what's happening next? How are you managing how the classroom flows? Not how are you responding to people's behavior? Those are different things. Too long, we treat them as the same because we're trying to police quote unquote bad kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. How you manage your class when we are in the real space is like, um, do students understand the routine of how to enter and how to get ready? Have you modeled it? Have you created a contract to model that? Do they understand what happens when and if? If mm -hmm. all of that is absent, all you are doing is trying to react to behaviors that are symptoms of you having no classroom design. Mm -hmm. Not manager, you have no classroom design. Mm -hmm. So people who were talking all the time, it's because you didn't model and you didn't set up a classroom design. Mm -hmm. And you didn't also try to audit your class of who's here. What are the different ways of showing active participation? Mm -hmm. If you're still looking for a quiet body and a hand on the bubble, and that's not who's in your room, mm -hmm. you've got to go back to the table. And there are lots of resources and ways that we can talk about this. Right. And I think mm -hmm. there's, just from my experience, not a lot of room made for, or not a lot of grace given to how you're actually nurtured and what your home space is like on. when you're talking about a mm -hmm. uh, managing your class or what the expectation is for behavior because if I come from a place where I have multiple siblings or there's multiple family living with me that's a that's a high energetic collaborative I touch we touch we move over here we stand close we don't versus being in a household that is we eat dinner at 6 p.m then we move here then we move here and I it, it's totally different and those 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 things are often associated with the culture that you that you come from yeah some cultures are very collaborative and some of them um are very they're raised in a village and some are not and when you do that that we put those kids together they're going to behave very differently yeah. in the space um so we have to recognize that um and, and I've, I've definitely come in contact with that and had to check myself plenty of times um, in, in, in the dance space and in the education space there. And I just want to add a quick uh, anecdote to what you're saying, just to give people a flip side of it. It is, I feel like students have, when I go into a space that is so about quiet bodies and I'm coming in there and I'm like, let's lean in and I'm getting nothing in response. I actually feel like the students are not doing what they're asked to do. Mm -hmm. If I was to go to that traditional yeah. route, like for yeah. me, I'm like, y'all being this, if I was, I'm not this person, but to me, I'd be like, y'all being disobedient. We're supposed to testify with our bodies. You should like being able to give feedback to folks. I grew up in a culture that's like, hey, go mm -hmm. ahead, like immediate feedback. And I go into places where it's like, please could a pin drop to just cause some noise. <laughs> I feel like this environment to me is bad. To me yeah. is a little toxic. Yeah, to yeah. me is absent of human connection. And so I just want to offer that like sometimes we're like, oh, you know, classroom management has been um, uh, positioned the wrong way. We're talking about places where the, the, the loud bodies are trying to be policed into silence. And I'm like, the, the, the other side of the spectrum also is not good, right? Like- yeah not allowing people to, to be and to try. So again, uh, acknowledging who's in the room and to de designing to that um, and not saying it's wrong because it looks different. Right. That's the opportunity. Yeah. We have a 
question in the chat. Any tips on how to manage resistance from dance parents? Yes. I'm working as an admin at a dance studio with a lot of conservative white families with money and I'm scared of them, to be honest. I want to do the work, but I also don't want to be the minority making waves. Great, beautiful question. And I appreciate that you are elevating your own psychological well-being. Um, uh, if you don't want to sign up to be a martyr, definitely don't. Or to be the exceptional uh, person of color, um, don't. I, I think it's very important to realize and to honor that you have to, you have some boundaries around. Like, I want to engage this but it would actually be harmful to me to try to do this alone. So one, I would say the best suggestion uh, from the jump is um, who's in your tribe, who's in your family, fictive, your play cousins, your real cousins, who, who can you lean on and go, ha have you done this before? What, what's worked? Could you, could you give me some tips on some first steps? Could you um, point me in the direction of someone who could help do this work so that you are also taken care of without now being come the caretaker and, and uncared for as well. Secondly, I would say with families, um, I think I used to have a real like, oh, dance parents, they think they know what's best. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, yes, and maybe they do actually know some things about their children, however, they've also been conditioned to see things work one way. And so there's a lot of unlearning that has to happen for adults and unlearning as an adult is really hard. So how can you design a night or an experience, a game night where people can just feel human and you can create an on-ramp to go like, here's some ways that we are trying to grow the studio. Um, here's some resources that we wanna have ex specifically for the students. And here's some resources we wanna try to have for the families as well, because what the kids might be able to adapt to and, and take one will be quicker probably than their parents mm -hmm. because, you know, prefrontal cortex, all of that. But I would say definitely um, don't, I would, I would say reach out and see like who's also doing this work. I have said to organizations that have brought me in to work with their white educators, I go as a black woman in this space, I'm going to, one thing, I'm about to give you a price that's high because I got to take care of my psychological well-being because this is hard. I believe in this work, but then I go, who have you contacted that can speak to this from a racial and economic um, identity that is more in line with your folks? Because people will also look at me as like the auntie Mamie taking care of the white folks in the room. And I've retired from that. Mm -hmm. um, I need to be working in collaboration with people. So I don't mind coming in, but who am I coming in with? Because I'm not about to put on no cape by myself. That's going to ruin me. So don't put no cape on by yourself. Um, and I'd love to stay in touch. There are some white educators who about this work. And quite honestly, I think it's their obligation to, um, to get their cousins. Mm -hmm. I keep it colloquial sometimes. If that didn't translate for you, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we, we had a comment that I wanted to highlight, Aisha, on um, Facebook uh, from Desir Desiree, or it could be Desiree. It's got two Desiree. Desiree. So I'm not Desiree. Desiree. Um, so what, when we were talking about uh, the ways that bias shows up in the studio, and I love this comment, the pictures on the wall, who you decide to present as people of interest, Bob Fosse, but no Tally B, B. Gene Kelly, but no Bojangles. It's the history that is presented, so. Yeah, that's right. again how insidious that erasure is and it normalizes it. So then what I've run into and I've spaces where like I'm working with young people who come up in the studio and they're really well versed into jazz and tap because that's another space in my life of like of movement really well, but from kind of the white Broadway history. So then when I'm sharing with them something about Bill Robinson or the Nicholas brothers, mm -hmm. there is resistance. And some of it's not because they don't think it's not true, but the resistance is like, why wasn't I told earlier? Mm -hmm. And so I also think um, having on the wall, lots of genders, mm -hmm. um, lots of different representations of folks within one race, because again, we're not monolithic. I think also, um, never zooming past the opportunity to ask who might your students actually know or be themselves. Right. You know, right. I went to school with like uh, Robert Reed's daughter, like this masterful tap dancer. And it's like, if they would have just had Gene Kelly up, it's like Robert Reed right here, <laughs> right. you know? And so also us realizing that sometimes it's right in the room. Mm -hmm. It's right in the room 
and that those those signals of who matters are definitely always around us. And again, right now they're just so way so many more resources than there were five years ago, ten years ago. That it's not as hard as people think it is to make one change. Like if you're starting with symbolic and gestural changes, I want to make sure that for me, I say that's okay. If you're not ready to completely throw the table out the window on day one, okay, can we take this chair back and like put a different chair up? So start with the symbolic and the gestural, but understand that's not the end of the journey. So if you're changing who's on the wall, the next step might be like, let's look at the class curriculum roster. Let's look at who we invite in as guests. Let's look in, are we only talking about black folks in February? Are we only talking about Latinx folks in October? You know, are we only talking, you know what I mean? Like, so then going through that program, like step by step by step, because there is a spectrum of things that we have to be committed to undoing, mm -hmm. understanding that starting with representation is not it because again a lot of people have black lives matter uh signs in their window but wouldn't want me to move next to them actually right this is this is so fantastic I, we could talk to you forever i, I do have one question, and then we're going to get to the homework and the resources uh, for everybody for this week. Um, for someone like me, who is not a person of color, but wants to learn and wants to be an ally and wants to make sure that we're raising our children to be all of those things. You know, I have a, a four and a seven year old, the blondest can be blonde, little white children, right? How and when do you have those important conversations at home with your children? I, you know, that that's the one thing I learned starting this journey is that like, I was so proud. We were so proud that our children didn't see race, right? Like that was like a big thing. Like we, we didn't, we didn't talk, like our kids don't notice that they've never asked, but then in that journey, I've learned that that's not necessarily the right way to go about it because I have to acknowledge these things. They have to it and they have to learn to be an ally for it out there what how do we have those conversations at home because it really does start at home yeah I mean listen I have never been anything else than um, black African American so I want to say that I hear you and I absolutely can't tell you uh yeah. what to do or whatever I say is definitely coming from that perspective and I say right. so um one is like Listen, everybody is amazing researchers. Everybody is a scholar right now. Yeah. <laughs> what you want, you want it as a documentary? You want it as a Netflix special? You want it as a book? Amazon has right. not slowed down. So I say that honestly because um, just as I have to do work to go, I want to know more about hip hop. I want to know more about tap. I want to know more about opening schools. I have to start there, right? And then I and then I go just do one thing. I think also, I think it's beautiful for you to call out that like you're able to say like celebrating that kids don't see race. Um, I know. It's, it's I, being able to, just being able to recognize that, that that is not the thing. Like I think a, a really funny thing is uh, I taught in North Dakota for 10 summers, right? Um, and I've watched that area become a little bit less uh, Scandinavian only or Norwegian only. Right. And there was a, my colleague's daughter was like five at the time. And she looked at me and she's like, did you drink a lot of chocolate milk? And I was like, oh my God, that's so yeah. hilarious. But at that point, like she has no context. This was years right. ago. Right? That's different now. Right. If I'm in Boston and somebody's child is like, did you drink a lot of chocolate milk? I'm going, how lazy is your parents? Right. Right. So right now I just think everybody, the work is do something. They're like literally something, read one thing and um, with children, it's never too early. Like I learned very immediately that it was very beautiful and loving and, and amazing to be African American. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn that from school. That came from home. Mm -hmm. right. And that I did not have to pay a lot of money for. That does not come after letters in my name, but that informs the essence of who I am. And I wouldn't trade it for the world just to be able to know who I am early. So, I mean, like, now right um and then also to i think it's important like i think affinity spaces are very important this is for everybody so there are some conversations that i am only going to have of a certain tenor that i'm only going to have with other black african-american identifying folk i'm not even saying people of color groups there are some things that i need to keep into a black space there are some spaces i need to keep into a woman's space there are some things that can be more broad brought more broad in it so i think that there's power also for folks who want to be 
I don't even think allies. I think there's power for, for white folks who want to be liberated and be in truth to be in spaces with other white folks who want to be liberated and be in truth. Mm -hmm. Because actually people of color have been trying to fix the mess that many eons of centuries ago, some very fragile white folks put into place. Mm -hmm. And so I go, I think a lot of the work is for white folks to figure out how to be in those spaces with each other and get that liberation and that truth work done within that affinity space. So that when we are in these spaces, like we can have the 10, the three of us are having this conversation because clearly we've been in spaces where we're doing work. Right. We can be here together in a progressive, solutionary, transformative, love, grace-filled way. Mm -hmm. But if I'm trying to like show up to this conversation in a room full of everybody, right. I'm not prepared for that. So I say for folks, get you into an affinity space where you can be held to truth and to task with grace so that you are a bit more equipped to, to engage as a listener in these um, diverse spaces and to engage as an agent for change. Mm -hmm. um, because I need less of an ally, to be honest, and more of people who understand that their role in the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't need to be rescued by anybody else. I need everybody to show up for their work that they are supposed to be doing so that those of us who have yeah. been doing work on behalf of other people can have our load redistributed in a way that is a, a bit more equitable, no, a whole lot more equitable. Yeah. So yeah. You're, doing, you're showing up, you're, I think, as early as they can talk. <laughs> and lastly, there's research out that all students do better when they're like being taught by not just like white folks, but they're taught by like an array of people, people of color. And I think all the literature that's coming out that has, that's written by folks of color and stars features people of color. I think those books for like little readers, little folks, I think it's important to put that literature in front of them as well. Cause if that's their first contact zone, then that's already normalizing. Like people aren't brown because they drank a lot of chocolate milk. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Thank you. Um, she she answered my next uh, question beautifully, which is what is, we like to give homework on Beyond the Steps for everybody watching something they can accomplish in the next seven days till our next episode. Um, so just to recap what that is, start researching, whether it's documentaries, whether it's books, um, whether it, it find your affinity space and make sure you're accountable in those spaces and continuing to do the work in those spaces. And I think I want to add on one more thing to that is listen, do a lot of listening and less talking. I think that for me, um, just seeing all of the, you know, there's some wonderful, wonderful things coming out that came out on Netflix over the summer and books that I was led to by certain people that were having really important conversations and Instagram and Insta stories. And instead of just flipping through, take a minute and listen to those things. Um, we also love to give resources. And Aisha, if you have any, please feel free to, to contribute. But I want to highlight Desiree Parkman is uh, somebody that was really actively participating today. She has a book called Dancing with Naima. And um, it, it's a wonderful book. If you have a young dancer, um, I know I, I will be getting it from my daughter this holiday season. Um, but it, just a wonderful book to share with, with your young dancer um, about a little brown girl um, on her on her dance journey and so uh, take a look at that it's on Amazon it, again it's dancing with Naima I also want to um, give a shout out to our friends uh, I think it's Desiree Parkman somebody just a asked me it's uh, Desiree D-S-I-R-E-E -E Parkman P-A-R-K-M-A-N um, and uh, Naima is also on um, IG dancing with Naima Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. And then um, uh, our sh a shout out to our friends at Brown Girls Do Ballet. I just talked to Takia Wallace on Wednesday and it's a nonprofit organization that is focused on spotlighting, um, uh, you know, a brown and black girls in the dance community. And they're just doing such amazing work. She is incredible. I and mean, we talk about a powerhouse, another powerhouse. We have Asia, we have Takia. Um, she's amazing. So again, that's browngirlsdoballet.com. Um, and, and if you're 
you're looking for an organization to support this holiday season, they are a fantastic uh, one to support. Um, and also our Steps 2020 initiative. If you guys don't know about it, we created this course. Uh, Melissa donated the, the racism module. We have uh, sex edu uh, education uh, and awareness and prevention, um, uh, injury prevention, integrative dance, nutrition, gender equity. It's a four, it's a course series that's going to take you through all of these things at your own pace and it is completely free. So if you go to our website, apollaperformance.com, you can uh, start taking that course today. If you are a dance educator, a parent, a dancer, you kind of have a responsibility at this point to take this course because we want happy, healthy, safe, equitable dance spaces for all. Um, and so again, we absorb the cost so that it is free for you. Steps 2020 initiative, take it today. Um, and Asia, any other resources you want to share with us as well? I'm a huge fan for anybody that likes uh, it's a little bit thicker, but um, Brenda Dixon Gottschild's uh, uh, The Black Dancing Body, a geography from Cole yeah. School was um, like scripture. Uh, Naima McCarthy Brown uh, has some public, some some works out on um, uh, culturally uh, relevant teaching in the dance and dance education. Um, Monsell Durden has a series called Intangible Roots that really looks at um, African diasporic dance telling the history and evolution. He offers it um, via IG cyclically. Um, those are the like three most immediate. There's a whole bunch in my brain, but I just those are the ones that rose up uh, most initially. And then the one last thing I would um, say is for people to embrace the spirit of reflection with grace. Again, none of us came on this planet doing it right from jump. So as you reflect, afford yourself grace and say, I can't commit to one thing and I'm committed to that one thing. If you journal it, I don't know. It's, voice memo. What's voice memo, but just <laughs> document your own journey for self, not as a performance for others. I think that also helps. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that grace, grace, grace. Um, intangible roots was that the book that you just you referenced? Somebody? It's a series. It's a I was, series. I, okay. I was talking about it's a um it's a it's like a a mini course series that Monsell Durden um has been offering uh on his uh, if you go find him on uh IG uh -huh. um, yeah somebody was asking asking for clarification on Facebook so it is intangible roots. Yeah, um, that's, that's in Monsell, M-O-N-C-E-L-L-D-U-R-D-E-N is how it's spelled. Thank um, you. So thank you so thank much. Thank y'all. This was so Thanks, cool. Asia. This yeah. was amazing. I know it, it's, it's a sensitive topic. It's uncomfortable for some people, but it's very necessary and it's necessary to normalize this conversation as well, um, or we're going to get nowhere. So you just really, it's not an easy subject, especially in this space, but you discussed it with grace and professionalism and we just love you to death for it. Thank you so much. Um, the recording of this full episode is available on Facebook at Apollo Performance in the video section. So anybody you know and you're like, oh my God, you need to go back and watch that. It was so amazing. Asia was wonderful. Tell them to go find it in the video section um, at Apollo Performance on Facebook or on Instagram. There's a link in bio at TPBC underscore on underscore IG that will lead you to this episode and all the past episodes of Beyond the Steps as well. Um, so uh Aisha, tell us where, what are your handles? Where can they find you on Instagram and Facebook? Yes. Um, so I am on Instagram. I'm Aisha Dances, A-Y-S-H-A Dances. Um, and that will, in my bio is a link to um, Dope is a Verb, which is my merch and uh, kind of movement project. Um, and also Hip Hop X, which is the lab that I uh, direct out of Harvard. But Aisha Dances on Facebook, I'm Aisha Upchurch. I'm the only Aisha Upchurch on the planet. There are other Asians and other wow. other churches, and I'm the only Asia of church. So uh, I shouldn't be too hard to find. I'd love to stay connected. Um, uh, next week, I'll be doing some programming Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday as part of our uh, closeout uh, for the year programming with Hip Hop X. Um, and then uh, in January, going to be starting a series with uh, I Am Dope, where we highlight different dope folks. Might see some of these people right here on there. <laughs> We're doing the work and realizing that education doesn't just pertain to what happens in brick and mortar spaces. So, um, yes. Thank you. And we hope to have you back. This was incredible. We already related. We good. We, this is the yeah. thing. You can't get away from us. You can't get away from us now. Uh, no. So as always, 
I am so honored to do this work with my friend Bree Zabrowski. Um, you can find us here every single Friday at 2 p.m. Next week on the 18th, the question is, what does plant-based eating look like for dance athletes with the guest Caroline Lewis-Jones? So uh, be here for that, especially since we're going on break and, you know, some people like to, um, like to go a little bit overboard on break, you know, in the holiday winter season. So uh, this might be a nice way to kind of balance some of the things that you may do over the break. Um, but until then, we hope you continue on your journey beyond the steps and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks, Aisha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.